when I built the Omega car, I just wiped the slate clean. The thing cracked 80 miles to the gallon the first time out, not even trying to get good miles to the gallon. Let's be eccentric and run around like idiots because we didn't plan this. What's up, people? So today I thought we would go back to the Omega car, which is my high fuel efficiency and recyclable manufacturing concept sports car. It's a lot of words. It's cool. Anyway, come on back. Um, and maybe you can stop kind of see it here. So the deal is, you guys, I am going to bring this back out. And I think it's important because in my opinion, in my experiences, I've been around a cars a long, long, long time. And for anybody that's ever worked, shall we say, at a classic car dealer, and there's many cars from all throughout history there, especially when you have to push them around, you realize how hugely inefficient the automobile actually is in general. And I don't care whether it's electric powered, it's hybrid, or it's an internal combustion engine only. Normal cars are massively inefficient. And that's why I, why I created the Omega car. Years ago, and come on over if you wanna look around, that's fine. Years ago, I was researching different methods of construction and fabrication and different uh, materials and chemicals and processes. And I realized one day that there's a myriad of ways to create a, a structure of an automobile that would be more sustainably recyclable, frankly, less environmental impact and less energy to create. So that's a big win because Let's take another car for example. So, and by the way, this car is not a frame with a body over it. Everything white you see is structural, just as a note. But let's, let's talk some different kind of cars. Obviously like the Dodge Viper and this Corvette are very strange. They're a composite body over a steel chassis. That's how it was for racing back when. It's time consuming and expensive to build. It's not easily recyclable. But uh, if you go back here just a little, or wherever is easiest to look, sorry, I'm trying to help the camera guy. So this car, yes, I know it's a freaking Lamborghini, but look, look past the sports car and all the silliness of it. This car is largely aluminum, has an aluminum chassis. And while this is hand built, made to be a sports car, this is a little bit more of the modern construction of cars. And it is recyclable in the sense that you can strip it down and you can melt down the metal like normal cars, which are unibodies and stamped steel typically but they're still hugely inefficient. Uh, and that goes, it, does, it really doesn't matter what it is. I mean, a Porsche 911, a silly design with all kinds of drag all over it. It's not that slippery. You go back into the 1980s when something was shaped like origami, like the Lotus Esprit, and that's not very aerodynamic as an example. So I'm sorry I don't have a more normal car in here to show you, but I, I don't think normal cars are very fun. But anyway, let's look at the Omega car here. So. I built this thing originally back in 2012. Uh, I did one drawing to show people basically what it was that I had in my mind, and I designed the thing in my head. Uh, since I had been fabrication, fabricating for so many years, I knew what I could build, uh, and that was important to me. If you want to walk around, I'll pop a door open so you can look at it. Maybe go, go back there, camera person. I'm doing the best I can, <laughs> guys. I created this prototype, hand fabricated, and um, I did it to represent a bunch of different processes and different IP that I could use to create um, mass-produced cars. And like I said, I think cars require way too much energy to create, way too much energy to move and are hugely fuel inefficient. So now this particular car is diesel powered, internal combustion, piston, four cylinder, and it has a turbocharger on it. Now I chose that because it would give me the opportunity to make the most power when I need it, a lot of torque, uh, diesel is a fairly flexible fuel in terms of the, shall we say, different ways you can make it and such that it will burn and work in here. Um, there's a lot of energy in it and um, you can also make it be very efficient. Now, this car originally, I wanted it to do two things to be successful for me. One, I wanted the manufacturing aspect to represent what could be more recyclable and less environmental impact. I wanted it to pull harder, harder and out accelerate the Viper to 60. That was one of them. And I wanted it to crack 100 miles to the gallon. So built the thing in 2012, 2013, and uh, I showed it at one private party, and then I parked it in my garage for a bunch of years. And the reason being is, and a lot of you won't, un won't understand this, but I, I need you to kind of just, let's, let's think here in a theoretical space. If you build something that's incredible, but no one ever gets to see it, and no media will pick it up, and you don't have the money to put behind it to build a whole manufacturing thing, 
then there's nothing you can do with it. The world won't care. So that's why I shelved it largely, and I, kind of, I was tired and burned out after building it uh, for a bunch of years. I want to bring up a couple of things. One, it was ridiculously fast. Um, it was amazing because the, con the thing that I built all those years ago, <laughs> it was a great structure. It drove well. It was ridiculously fast and would do insane burnouts. And I know that's not fuel efficient, nor is it good for the environment, but <laughs> it does at least prove the point that the car is going to be quite fast and it pulls better than the Viper anyway. So we were all way too excited about that. But the other thing was, when we just got our more precision fuel level gauge in and we precisely measured how much fuel was in the tank, we took it out for a test. And we were just going to drive it through the countryside, maybe 15 miles. And so we were doing some hard pulls, driving really fast, accelerating hard, using a bunch of fuel. We're just kind of cruising around. We were not trying to get good fuel mileage and we we're stopping and slowing and going and stopping and slowing. And just by the basic calculation we made on the fuel that we used, the thing cracked 80 miles to the gallon the first time out, not even trying to get good miles to the gallon. So I was really excited about it. But a couple of years ago, the world was very different. The United States was different, media was different, and people's interests, i.e. also the internet algorithms, were very different. And I kept working on it. I thought I was gonna finish it, but I could tell the world didn't care as much as I thought they should. So again, I shelved it. And the reason being is, a few years ago, well, we weren't at war with the Ukraine with high fuel prices. Uh, the world hadn't, let's see, that was 2020, so the world was blowing up in a different way socially. And we were all frustrated about that and presidential elections and everything going on. And it seemed that on the internet, the only thing anybody cared about were stupid supercars. And I say that in the nicest way because obviously I love fast cars that are, that are pretty and go fast. But if that's all the world cares about are flashy supercars, you know, it's the wrong time to bring this out. However, now, let's be real. Fuel prices are ridiculous. And I would say across the board, around the entirety of the world, politicians are failing us. <laughs> and the world is a mess. So I think that is reason enough that something like this needs to be looked at again. And so I'm bringing it back out. And I wanted to show it to you guys again. There's some things about it that's interesting. Over all the years that I've had it, since it's experimental materials, I noticed there's some micro shrinkage of it. So there's some like waves and dents and things happening and occurring. But yeah, there's some things like that. And for when I want to go show this in public specifically, I'm going to have to refinish some things just so it looks better. Obviously, it's handmade and experimental. So some little inconsistencies like that, uh, obviously, you'd work out if you were going to mass produce it. But I'm really excited about it. Obviously, you guys, for anybody looking at it, you can tell that the way I was able to get those kind of numbers, the acceleration, as well as the fuel efficiency is one, you just tune the darn thing to get good fuel efficiency, okay? I picked basically the motor that I thought was the most readily available in the United States to give me the possibility to make the most power and be the most efficient, okay? So that's what I chose. But the thing is, the prototype, as well as others I could create with the same process, I could make them be internal combustion, they could be electric, they could be hybrid, etc. Although I'm not a huge fan of hybrid because I think it's just a bunch of band-aids to make people feel good and making cars too complex. The point of this was to make something simple. That's why it's inherently cheaper, safer, and more efficient and takes less energy to produce. All important things. And that goes back to the point where the reason I chose not an internal combustion engine like this is it's much easier for people to understand miles to the gallon and acceleration based on that, based upon everything we know, versus understanding the intricacies and the nature of electricity storage, what it takes to produce it, how it goes into a car, etc. And the truth about electric cars, the general populace thinks it's a band-aid because there's no emissions at, of the electric car out the tailpipe. They're not huffing tailpipe fumes and seeing fire belching out of the back of a tailpipe. So they think it's great. But there are a lot of downsides to electric cars as well, and the, the production of them, the production of batteries, the recycling or trying to recycle of that. And of course, where does the electricity come from? Electricity can't be stored in mass quantities. There's no giant batteries or capacitors out in the American Southwest. You have to produce ba electricity based upon demand on a local or national level. So there's some issues with that. Of course, electricity is good in certain places, but it's not great everywhere. So these are the reasons why I chose internal combustion initially to show the concept. But so the things I got to do on this to test it again, I want to get I'm going to get it out and test. First of all, I have to finish 
the Formula One hot rod, as I call it right here, which I'm just finishing up right now, plumbing it, doing the electrical, got to get the air uh, jacks on it and then get it done. So this is about done. When that's done, then I can futz with these other things because I actually have to make a living. There's no magic money tree here, Durr. But uh, I wanna do a new steering rack. I'm not happy with the one that was in it. There's too much play, it needs to track really well. I need to do a precision alignment. I have to get rid of some of the micro shrinkages on here, but should be really ready to go. I've got some electricity feedback going with my rear view camera system in here because I didn't wanna have outside mirrors because one of the stupidest things there are on cars and trucks everywhere are the mirrors. All these mirrors require a ton of energy to move around, especially nowadays when we have such great camera systems and video cameras, you can have cameras and make a car far more slippery and more fuel efficient by getting rid of it. Hence why this does not have any outside mirrors. It does, however, have mirrors on it, so it's legal, but I just decided to get rid of things that are stupid. <laughs> it's pretty simple. So when you wipe the slate clean and stop thinking convention, uh, and actually uh, semi-trucks, there's a company that actually produces uh, cameras to replace those big mirrors because it saves a lot of, lot, a lot, a lot of fuel um, and they have the legal ability to do that. So regulations are changing a little bit to be able to do things like that, thankfully. So I'm going to the steering rack. I got to get rid of the electronic feedback with the rear view camera system. Cooling well, it drives well. Um, I had to adjust the seats and the ergonomics. Uh, I, uh, I made the seats be fixed and then you adjust the pedals and the steering wheel. It's, it's also far simpler and cheaper and inherently safer to have the seats be part of the monocoque, more like a racing car. It's just simple and it makes it cheaper and easier because seats are stupid. Can I just show you guys how stupid automotive seats are by looking at this Porsche? Let's go in the office. Run with me. Yes. Let's be eccentric and run around like idiots because we didn't plan this. Okay guys, so here's the seat. It's a Porsche seat. Obviously we're not knocking Porsche, it's a nice seat, but this represents normal car construction of a seat. God, it's heavy. One, they're freaking heavy, which means you gotta burn a lot of fuel to drag it around. And the reason they have to be so heavy is because they're bolted to the floor. They're not secured in the back at all. So they have to be very, very strong to do a lot of engineering things for the event of crash and support because they're just inherently stupid. I mean, this is just an expensive convoluted steel leather chair bolted to the floor of a steel car. Stupid, stupid. <laughs> anyway, okay. Yes, I gotta call something stupid. My favorite pastime, come. So let's go back. So basically guys, that's what's up with the Omega car. It, it was something that was important to me and I kind of had to kick myself in my own butt because in the last year I've been chasing, doing other things with my career, racing, obviously with cars, trying to make a living. Um, wanted to try to make some dreams come true with racing uh, American open wheel on a professional level. And it's sad, which is sad because it, this kind of car and this concept is important regardless of what time or where we are. In fact, Gavin, I think I'm gonna push that forward a little bit so we can see it better. But um, I wanna get that back out, you guys, so you can see what's going on. I think the concept matters and I want to at least get the zero to 60 times and the miles to the gallon. Um, and then if I want to go show it off somewhere, I can refinish the outside of it. But uh, just some fun things. You can see the micro shrinkage for the dent, but it's a big NACA duck at the top. I brought the air in off the top where it's clean and uh, cool. And then you can see the inner cooler here is for the turbo. So the cool air coming from the top, fills this area and then there's a hole and then this creates a low pressure. This whole area back here creates a low pressure as it goes through and a cam tail effect. And a cam effect, which was studied in Germany, I think in the 20s, um, tricks the airflow into making it think the car is longer and more teardrop shape in the way it comes off and creating low pressure. So I put everything back here that I wanted to have a low pressure. So the radiator, picks up the air from a higher pressure place underneath through the engine bay and then out the back right here, which is smart. And then it uh, flows the air up underneath the, uh, the monocoque where your seat. And then um, of course it pulls the low pressures to the intercooler that needs to be cooled. And even the exhaust system is uh, back here. And I thought about making a um, attenuator type thing. So as the exhaust comes out, that also you utilize that energy to create uh, a low pressure so you can cool the intercooler even when it's not moving, but that's kind of pointless because 
you don't need to make that much power when it's not moving. So um, I probably won't do that. It just adds expense for no reason. How far? Stop? Okay. So that's it guys. Beyond that, the lights, all the lights on this are LED high efficiency so they don't take much electricity because electricity on an internal combustion engine car is not free. You have to generate it with your alternator from the engine moving. So that's drag. So you want to use little electricity and you want to use as little power as it takes to push it through the air. So the other aspect is, and if you go over there and look at it again, the entire car is very slippery for a low coefficient of drag. A number of ways of doing that. One is just the shape, but two, not having any big parasitic drag with any big mirrors on it. That's one way to get rid of it. Two obviously relates somewhat to the leading edge, but leading edges are not as important as the trailing edge. So studying the back and having the cam tail effect and managing how I make air flow in around and then come back together at the end is what the important part is. The other aspect is to keep the car narrow and not be a super wide profile, um, the, these wheel covers here, if you look at them, this is aluminum, but when the car moves, those do not spin. Those are mounted on the hub in the center. You can see they're not spinning, but it does follow the wheel and the tire closely. So as it turns, it follows and goes up and down. But generally speaking, when you're driving in a highway or roadway and you're getting, needing to get good fuel efficiency, you're generally always going straight or just barely turning at all. So in this circumstance, yeah, there's a little bit of a gap here, but it still does a really good job at streamlining the car. And then the rear, because the rear tires don't have to turn like the front, it's very easy to fare them in. And I understand that not seeing the wheels on a car is the opposite of a cultural norm. Think about that for a second. If you look around this room, there's a lot of very cool cars and, and historic high points of racing cars and street cars. But the one thing they all share in common is you can see the wheels on them, which is stupid. <laughs> but this car, race car, it has one big nut so they can be taken off and removed very easily in a racing series. And they're not worried as much with the drag, but there were racing series and times where they would fare in the rear tire because you get higher top speed or you create better downforce, etc. And the funny thing is, so even if it's a supercar like this or that or a sports car, it doesn't really matter. If, it's, if a car's on the street, we're not taking the wheels and tires off very often. It's not a pit stop sort of a thing. So if in fact we covered our wheels and tires, we would gain a lot of fuel efficiency. So that's, that's what I did with this. And I understand that's very weird for people and maybe not as sexy as they're used to in conventional thinking. So that's why when I built the Omega car, I just wiped the slate clean, started from the ground up and considered what materials and processes could I use, whether it's biological base, polymer, metals, et cetera, or some sort of experimental composites. By the way, fiberglass and carbon fiber are horrific for the environment and not very recyclable unless you tweak a bunch of things. So I don't love those materials. Anyway, this car, it's just, it's a blank slate. Now there are some aspects of it, of course, that would not relate to a production version. For instance, how I did the glass and such, but it's how I did it because I had to form this by hand, a one-off car without spending millions of dollars for a prototype and having a giant team of corporate people that couldn't find their rear exit from a different, from a hole in the ground. So, yeah, that's the one-off prototype. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that back up to you guys. So for anybody new, just checking it out now, the Omega car being highly fuel efficient, being lower environmental impact, sustainably recycled, and hopefully cool looking, because sadly we live in the Western world where it doesn't matter how great the concept is, loyal, awesome, money saving, or good for the environment is, no one cares unless it's sexy. So that's why it's a sports car and hopefully you guys think it's cool. So I'm gonna get going back on it, but I hope you'll comment below um, something nice and supportive uh, or just what you think I should do with this or good ideas. I'm open to that. It's a nice community, but I kind of just wanted to bring it back up, get it to the forefront with the channel. So you guys uh, know that I'm gearing up to do something again with it. And I hope it inspires you to build something, whether that's a model or the future, but I'm looking forward to seeing what it can do. Hopefully we're doing over hundred miles to the gallon and it'll be a lot of fun one day to see it out accelerate the Viper. Although I do have to be honest, it's going to be a little tricky because this thing's got much bigger, stickier tires on the rear. And this has got far narrower ones that are fuel efficient. So this does not hook as well as that does from a dig. So could be a really fun race. But until that time, that's it guys. Look forward to see you next time.